Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody for coming and thanks to Carol for having me. Um, basically I'm just going to give a little bit of background on um, myself and how I came to be in a position to, to write this book, uh, the cover there. And then I'm going to run through the 50 tallest buildings from the guidebook. Uh, I'm not going to just you know, talk about every one of them or we'll be here for uh, a bit too long. But you can see them actually mapped on the uh, right side. And, um, but basically, I mean, I went to, uh, I'm from Chicago, from outside Chicago, and I went to school at Kansas State University. And I, you know, with every intention of becoming an architect, and I did, but while I was there, I, I edited a journal called Oz, which is a yearly student-run publication. And at the time, I thought it was fun, and it allowed me to, uh, you know, talk to architects that I really admired and have them contribute work. Um, but I didn't think it would be necessarily much more than that. But then, as I was working, you know, moving back to Chicago, I felt like um, this interest in other architects' work was not, um, you know, I wasn't getting that um, satisfaction in my job, which was very much, you know, you only look at what we've done, you know, in terms of uh, design. And it was an SOM offshoot, which every other firm in Chicago is. So um, I started a web page in 1999 called A Weekly Dose of Architecture, which I was doing these kind of weekly sketches and it just seemed like, well, I was uh, doing that, that journal in college and why not just share what I'm doing, you know, talk about these buildings that I like and just highlight them on a web page. And um, over time I added a blog, which is now, you know, Daily Dose of Architecture, which is probably more popular than the Weekly Dose, but anyways, so just over time, I've been doing this sort of uh, writing alongside working, you know, in an architecture office. And then I decided to come to New York to go to um, urban design at City College and um, graduated from there in um, 2007. And um, then at the end of 2008, when I was working in a firm here, I, um, like many architects, found myself without a job. and. Um, the following year, I decided to, um, you know, that summer of 09, I actually pitched to Norton an idea to do a contemporary guide. They had been sending me books to review on my webpage, and that was one of the perks of doing my webpage and liking books and reviewing books was I got a lot of free books. And I reviewed two of their guides, the MAS Walking Tours and Public Art New York. And I thought, you know, why not have a contemporary guide? And they were kind of shocked that there was no other guide since maybe um, 05, and it was one of those little, little guidebooks that used to come out um, every so often. So um, it was in that summer that I pr sent my proposal, they accepted it, and then about a year and a half later, handed in the, um, the manuscript. And basically the, the criteria that I used, I set out for myself, were that these buildings would be um, public in nature in terms of you'd be able to experience them in some manner. Um, it might just, like the Austrian Cultural Forum, um, well, that, that's when you can get inside, so it might have some public components on the inside, but it might be just a public facade, you know, something that uh, forms part of the street, it might be a public space. Um, it might just be an interior, but as long as it's something that the public um, can experience, um, ideally without paying you know, too much money or any money to go see. But, um, so I didn't, I didn't do like uh, re office interiors and things that other guidebooks would do. And I, didn't, I left out restaurants and retail for the most part because I wanted to be long-term additions to the cityscape. And even though a lot of those plan on being long-term, they're, they're, they usually come and go fairly quickly. So, um, so that was basically the, or the criteria, and then just, uh, I guess, from this accumulation of going about the city, and, and I should mention there's a third web page that I started in 06, I think it was, called The Architourist, where when I would travel to different um, cities, I would just post some photos and a map, directions to see a building. It's very, um, you know, maybe two sentences on the project. Um, but that was um, something that I accumulated a lot for New York before moving here in 06. So um, with that, the, the goal is 200. 
um, projects from 2000 to present, and then there's some sidebars that are interspersed throughout the book. Um, but then they're broken down by, um, by neighborhoods, or there's about 22 chapters. So each one is a, you know, ideally a walkable chunk of the city that you can experience. Um, and that's kind of how I tend to experience the city, so that's kind of how I structured the book. Um, so anyways, then um, I was kind of a little shocked to you know, um, hear that Carol wanted me to do this because I, in the introduction, I'm somewhat critical of tall buildings and the fact that um, I'm not a huge fan of tall buildings. I like good tall buildings, but I think there's a lot of you know, so-so or bad ones that other guidebooks would highlight. It seemed to be more about the changing skyline of the city rather than how you kind of experience the city. And in, in those cases, I actually will talk, you know, be at the New York Times building or Hearst Tower, which are kind of at two ends of the spectrum about what happens when they meet the ground, how can you experience them? You know, the New York Times, you can walk through the lobbies. Um, in the Hearst building, you get to the bottom of the fountain and then that's it, you can't go any further. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, I thought, why not just put together the 50 tall buildings? You know, there's my subjective list that's in the book, but then maybe just objectively take the 50 tallest and see what happens. So that's the idea um, here. And I'll just get started with the first slide. Um, and what you'll, what you'll notice as, as the slides progress is um, each building is going to be marked and then there's going to be kind of these, these lines connecting them. So it's going to create this kind of mishmash of uh, connect the dots. And it's, it's a little, you know, it's arbitrary or, or, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean anything, but it kind of, it reinforces the grouping of all these tall buildings. And, and likewise, um, the height of the building is noted there. And you'll see the, the heights go up as the um, slideshow progresses. Um, and like I said, some of these I'm just going to like uh, note, others I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, this is uh, Cooper Union by Morphosis. Uh, it's a lead platinum building. Um, it's actually, um, if my research is correct, a nine-story building. Definitely not what you would think of in terms of a tall building, um, but given that it's 142 and nine stories, it has a very generous um, floor to floor heights for uh, the academic um, functions in there. And it's, it's actually, I mean, it, nine, nine uh, stories is where you probably want to be using an elevator, but um, one thing that Tom Main from Morphosis does a lot in his buildings is do the skip stop elevators. So, and that, that's used here around or adjacent to the, this uh, sizable atrium that he kind of expresses on the exterior with this uh, cut through the, the mesh veil or the perforated metal veil. So, um, you know, even within a, you know, nine or so story building, he is kind of making, um, you have to walk up and down the building to a certain degree. Um, the next one. Um, this is uh, IAC building, uh, Frank Gehry. Um, this, I'll just kind of point out how it's roughly the same height, but where the morphosis one was almost like a cube that was uh, kind of with the swooping metal. Uh, here the swooping is happening in two parts where I think, um, you know, the, the setback at, I'm guessing it's at the like 85 foot mark, which, you know, because of zoning, uh, a lot of um, buildings will go up to 85 feet and then set back and then keep rising. Um, so you'll kind of see that um, repeated, but the, uh, the curves that shows verticality don't continue. And I, I think they do in one spot, and it's actually the loading dock, uh, which you can't see here. Uh, next one. Um, this is a uh, um, Madison Avenue Shop Architects, um, where they, um, I think this is an existing building, and they inserted these horizontal windows that kind of lean out towards uh, facing Madison Square Park to, um, to the south. And then it sets back at the at the top. Um, next one. And this is um, one Kenmare Square by Gluckman Manor Architects. Um, you know, I, I gave a I gave a talk at um, McNally Jackson, 
And there I focused on trying to find some trends that are uh, tying all these contemporary buildings together because if anything, you know, th there's, it's very much uh, pluralist in terms of form and, and expression, um, but there are still these trends that you can find throughout um, buildings and, and one of those is kind of these undulating walls and this is definitely um, within, that, um, within that style. Um, next one. This uh, is the only one I'm showing that is a uh, renovation. Um, this um, probably a lot of people know because of um, the preservation battle to save. Uh, this is to Columbus Circle, which was the Edward Durrell Stone building with the lollipop columns, which are, I think all but one of those at the base is preserved. Um, but they're, they're very much, I mean, you can't really see them from, from the exterior, they're, they're played down. Um, but this is uh, 10 stories inside and I, I actually, I'm not in love with the building but I like the way that these cuts go inside and become part of the floors, become these like uh, little uh, skylights almost connecting the floors. And um, does anybody here work for Allied Works? <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, if you go to their webpage, um, that, that H, that, that was um, the, the the horizontal is uh, the cafe, and in the original design, there was just the two verticals. But if you go to their webpage, the the horizontal is it's gone. <laughs> They're photos, but they've been they've been uh, photoshopped to be more of the, the glazed white brick in between the two verticals. So somebody brought that to my attention, but I I never shared it on my uh, webpage. Um, next one. Um, this is uh, Ten Architectos, um, Enrique Norton. He um, had a really busy decade. Um, also did um, the Mercedes House, which is I think nearing completion on the west side. A uh, hotel off of the High Line and then a, a building, in, a residential building in uh, Brooklyn. And I think all of these were, except for the one by the High Line, were residential. Um, but I don't know if he's doing anything else after these, but this is um, an example where the, the tall portion is this glass thing that's kind of landing on this uh, old building, which I think is, um, I think part of it is existing, but part of it is kind of rebuilt to match the old one. Um, next one. Um, Stephen Gaynor School on the Upper West Side by Rogers Marble. Um, and I think they're doing some some work on this as well. I'm not I'm not sure. It's just getting wrapped up. I'm not sure the extent of it, but I like how there's a there's a window, big window on the on the facade uh, opens to the the setback volume that um, is where the height is actually. So next one, uh, Richard Meyer in in Brooklyn. Um, this um, chronologically comes after his. Um, towers on Perry and Charles Street that are coming up, um, but it's basically kind of more of the same. It's the full height glass with the the white um, steel spandrel, and here the frosted glass on the on the balcony. Um, if you see this from this is overlooking the park, and then you have Grand Army Plaza out of shot to the to the left. Um, if you look from that distance, I think the depth of the building is probably greater than, than the height. It's a pretty big building. Next one. This is on, uh, on East 57th Street um, near Sutton Place, and um, it's an extremely narrow like, sliver building, which I think is even accentuated by the fact that there's this, this space um, in between um, it and the neighbor. And it, but it does enable these corner windows to happen. And um, I think in the, the book I talk about this being kind of a, they're looking at Pierre Chereau with the way the, the, um, the whitish glass has the sprit pattern as well as kind of Piet Mondrian. It seems to be a very modernist um, building that they were um, creating. Uh, next one. El, um, El Arasi in, in Soho. Um, which, uh, this is the uh, Broadway facade, the uh, Prince Street, or not Prince Street, sorry, the, um, what's that? Mercer Street. Mercer Street, yeah. Facade is much different with these uh, 
these kind of arch shape um, steel um, structured uh, pieces on the other side here. He's definitely relating to both of the, uh, the neighbors. Um, I think this one is also, um, because it's relating to these cast iron neighbors, the um, floor to floor heights, there's only 10 floors, 155 feet, so very generous floors like the old, uh, old buildings there. Next one. Um, heading up to the Bronx, and I think this will be the only one up there. Um, more of a more of a ship than a tall building. I mean, it's uh, it, you know basically a full block, um, and even the, the the verticality of these kind of ruffles ridges, um, you know, doesn't make it look like a, a tall building. But um, here I, I'm. Um, most disappointed by the, the public space on the back of the building, which I think is still closed to the public. It's, it, I think they still have fencing around it where it's, it's off limits, but the intention from the beginning was to have that be um, a public plaza. Um, next one. This is uh, Neil Denari's um, building on 23rd Street right next to the High Line, which you can see it cantilevers out and over. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm guessing that they were uh, taking some air rights from um, other parcels, which the special district that the city created, the zoning district for the High Line, enabled them to to not just have air rights from the neighbors, but be able to um, buy up air rights from other properties in the district, which I think is a fairly unique thing in in the city. Um, next one. Uh, blue condos by uh, Bernard Schumi, which um, to me it's kind of like a uh, almost like those old Hugh Ferris drawings. It's like a, a diagram of the zoning envelope. He probably did not let it just be simply that, but I think he's responding to it um, through the shape of the building. Um, next one. This is. Um, Dance Studios on 42nd Street by Platt Byer Doval White, um, which they, I think they do a very good work, very well-crafted buildings, and this one has a uh, double wall facade with these horizontal louvers that uh, during the day kind of give it a gray appearance, but at night they're all uplit with colored glass, or colored light, I, excuse me, um, to, you know, illuminating the underside so as you're walking by and looking up you kind of get this uh, kaleidoscope of, of colors and they're relating obviously to Times Square um, without incorporating advertising or making it just a, a LED uh, show of um, you know different images it's just all about color. Um, next one. This is uh, Jean Nouvelle's 40 Mercer Residences just down the street uh, from the Elder Rossi Scholastic Building. Um, here again, a, a setback happening uh, at about that 85 foot level. And um, I don't think, there's actually these, these pieces are um, operable walls that um, I think they slide to the side. There's a, there's a picture in, in the book but um, you know, a photographer that was lucky enough to, to be there when uh, one of them was open and somebody was peering out. Um, but um, yeah, next one. The New Museum of Contemporary Art, which um, the, the first, well, besides the, the Museum of Arts and Design at Columbus Circle, the first tall um, museum in the slideshow. Um, I don't think that these um, seven boxes, including the, the storefront, are seven floors. I think there's additional floors within it, but it's basically expressing the tall gallery spaces that are um, uh, that make up the building. Um, and this is probably um, the first, at least uh, I can think of, the, the thing that kind of building that's uh, allowed these other um, pieces down further up the street on the Bowery to, to happen. Um, this kind of, for me, the, the Bowery, this the first time I ever came to New York uh, with my wife, we stayed at a place called the White House, 
which is a, which is, yeah, I don't know if anybody knows that, but you walk up the stairs and I think it's a flop house on one side and hostel on the other side, so we were on the right side, but, um, <laughs> you know, and there's no, the, the walls are open on the top, and, um, but anyways, you know, and, and for, for me, the Bowery has always kind of been this place where the gentrification kind of didn't, didn't penetrate, but with the new museum, it obviously um, has happened. Uh, next one. So here's the, um, the two early towers that Richard Meyer did along the uh, West Side Highway. Um, in a couple slides, we'll see uh, the, the Charles Street um, building to the right, but this one um, used frosted glass on these balconies, something that changed and the later one had this kind of white frame facing the Hudson and then each resident um, occupied a uh, full floor. And I walked, um, took the afternoon off and kind of walked up the Hudson, Hudson River Park on the way up uh, down here today and some of those, I think they're uh, duplexes. You can see the stairs and so on. But anyways, uh, next one. This is a building on Union Square Park that is an addition to the old Tiffany building which is um, a building that had all this uh, ornamental cast iron and I think one piece fell, killed somebody in the middle of last century. So the amalgamated bank who owned it at the time just stripped all the ornament off, um, covered it with white brick and then when uh, Perkins Eastman and Aaron Chan from ODA um, got their hands on it, they discovered the old cast iron Arch structure underneath, and then you can kind of see it. See it here. Kept that as an um, kind of an integral part of the the design. And I think if you go there now, the retail tenants on the ground floors have painted them all gaudy green and things like that. Um, but it's a it's seven floors on top of five, and um, to me it, it it works in that it doesn't necessarily look like something that kind of plopped down on an old building. It kind of looks like a cohesive uh, composition overall. Um, the next one. So this is the Charles Street um, Tower where you can, these um, guardrails become clear and then there's two units per floor and you can see that in this kind of uh, vertical stripe going up the building in the middle. Next one. Um, Baruch College Vertical Campus, I believe 17 floors, uh, has an atrium that goes, uh, brings sunlight from the south and um, kind of goes down a diagonal all the way through the building to, to this space. Um, I haven't read if KPF were inspired by the um, armory building, but to me it's um, pretty clear that they probably were, not just in the, in the shape of, the, of the, the building, but the way that high point kind of gestures towards the armory building. John, John they were, because I asked them that. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> um, next. And I think with that building, we're over 200 feet. Um, the Rafael Maneo's uh, Northwest Corner building, which um, is, how many floors is this one? It um, has very tall floor to floor, 14 floors, but that's on this um, this facade. These are these are Columbia, Columbia University, um, <laughs> right where the white dot is. Um, and then on the east facade is where the offices are. There's uh, two. There's a mezzanine inserted into each floor here. So on the uh, on the east facade, it's more of a um, smaller scale curtain wall. Um, but this one actually spans. There's a gymnasium under the building and so it's hard to see here but basically the the building um, spans from here all the way over somewhere over here so this is all open on these lower levels uh, and that's where the library is and the the level of the campus is I think somewhere up here you can see that escalator going up to that level so when you're on campus and you're looking through the building that whole library um, kind of makes the building look like it's coming down on these two points. Uh, the next one. Um, another building that's taking advantage of the uh, Highline uh, zoning, uh, standard 
Hotel by um, now Ennead Architects. Um, next. The John Jay College Criminal Justice, which is one of a number of buildings that was uh, documented um, for my book while it was under construction. I think this opened um, last fall. Um, it's basically a new, almost cubic volume on 11th across from uh, McKim Mead and White's old IRT power station. And um, then there's a um, kind of an atrium that connects it to the old building, um, the college's old building on 10th Avenue. Um, but it basically has the, these, these fins that are kind of a small scale um, addition to the, the facade, but then they're cut by these larger openings. Um, and then the, those fins as well are colored in different ways. So some will be red on one side or not the other. So it creates all this kind of various effects on the facade. Next. Uh, Wheel Greenberg Center, um, Ennead Architects um, again, um, which I, I didn't know about this. Well, I learned about this building because my daughter was born across the street and then kind of going for a, a walk one day saw this building with this interesting, it has these white kind of milky frit patterns on it that come down to the ground. Um, but it's kind of doing this, this wave um, that's um, capped by this, all that mechanical needed for a hospital building. Next. Um, MoMA, um, you know, it's hard to tell that there's actually a 244 foot portion of um, Taniguchi's um, addition, which I believe it, it's the top of this up there, where it's kind of that, uh, again, kind of like a milky glass. Um, but I uh, believe that's the offices uh, for MoMA. And, um, but it kind of gets lost in, in you know, the uh, Caesar Pelli um, tower from uh, the 80s. And then, um, you know, we'll see what happens down the road when, if the Jean Nouvel tower which is planned to be uh, 1,050 feet and then I'm curious what is going to happen with the uh, old folk art museum which they bought. Um, next. Um, speaking of Jean Nouvel, this is across the street from uh, Frank Gehry's IAC building in Chelsea um, where he's basically using a, a unitized system but then kind of gets flipped and rotated and all the different panels are angling this way and that. And I mean, you can kind of see these horizontal bands marking the floors, but it, you know, ultimately it just becomes this chaotic um, grid, pixelized grid um, across the facade. Um, next. Uh, another building on the Bowery, this is Cooper Square Hotel um, by Carlos Zapata. Um, the building in the frame there is the Morphosis Cooper Union building. Um, if you look from the front, which sorry this picture doesn't show, but, um, this, um, the hotel kind of as it comes down, it seems to get pinched by these old buildings, these, these neighbors here, and then there's one on the other side. Um, well, that one's gone now. Um, I'm not sure what is going to be uh, happening in its place, but um, it seems like the justification for that, that pinch is um, no longer. So, next. Um, Seldorf Architect, Annabelle Seldorf, a um, uh, 200, this is just uh, up the street from the Jean Nouvel building. Uh, this is uh, notable because of the ensuite car garages, um, or sky garages, I guess they're called. Um, so you can drive in to the garage, take the elevator with your car up to your own garage immediately off of your um, apartment. Um, I guess vertical suburbia, I would call it. Um, next one. One Astor Place by Gwathmi Siegel and Associates. Um, not one of my favorites, um, and you know, I, I, I think I in the book talk about uh, some of the more you know um, prominent critics what they have to say about the building. But one thing I, I mean, as I visited all these buildings, I, you know, this one has a, a plaza, but instead of it, 
kind of being on the on the front or this prominent face uh, overlooking the the bigger space. It's it's around the corner next to the entrance and exit to the underground parking garage. So nobody was was there. It was kind of windy, and you know, with the cars coming in and out, it wasn't a pleasing place to be. So it's kind of a a letdown even in that in that regard. Uh, next one. Austrian Cultural Forum, which is on the cover of the book. Um, probably um, one of my favorite buildings from um, last decade. And, um, you know, the 25 uh, foot width and 24 stories um, obviously makes it appear, um, you know, extremely tall, even though it's uh, shorter than its, uh, its neighbors. And um, I met with the executive uh, director, and I mean, it's been, actually been well documented, but he was telling me that basically Raven Abraham won this commission because he put the scissor stairs at the back um, as opposed to kind of like a townhouse putting them on the side. So all that 25 foot width would be used from floor to floor rather than uh, a good chunk of it being lost by the stairs. Um, I mean, I like to think that it has something to do as well with this aggressive facade, but um, at least that's what they, what they say. It's all about the stairs. Uh, next one. Um, the United States mission to the UN, um, a big concrete bunker across from the UN. Um, you can see that the, the windows get bigger as you go up, I guess, expressing uh, some idea of uh, blast resistance. So the higher you get, the more uh, windows you can have. But um, it's interesting to contrast this with the reskinning of the UN across the street because that is staying all glass, obviously, but it's you know a, some sort of blast resistant um, glass. So and there's buildings like the Oklahoma Federal Building that Ross Barney uh, designed that also use glass. So. Um, to me, just the decision to go with concrete it says something that's just, um, you know, trying to be as almost oppressive, overbearing um, building as opposed to something light and um, take, still taking into account security measures. Um, next one. Um, close to here, uh, River House um, by Ennead Architects. Um, 300 feet. Um, obviously, it's, it's this piece. And then this um, is part of it. And then I believe that it's a U-shaped courtyard. So there's another low piece uh, to the east that has a public library. And actually this, this face has the poet's house, which is uh, in the base. Um, but by positioning the, the tall building on the south, that U-shaped courtyard, which is an extension of Teardrop Park, um, loses sunlight for most of the day. So uh, the solaire, which is out of frame to the, to the left, um, has heliostats mounted on the roof that then will move throughout the day. Basically, they're big mirrors. And those will move throughout the day to direct sunlight uh, down into that, uh, to the park. Um, and if you go, you'll actually just see these pinpoints of light moving around the, the courtyard. Um, just don't look up at them. Um, next one. And then even closer, uh, the Visionaire, which is, um, I believe, the most uh, recent building on this part of uh, Battery Park City, um, and probably the last, I think, tall building. Um, but it's a, oh, the school, yeah, the school by Datner, I think, came just after it. But um, it's a, a lead platinum building, which uh, Battery Park City is, um, you know, um, they've incorporated uh, lead, I think lead silver is what they've uh, mandated for all their buildings, but this one goes all the way to, to platinum. Um, next. Torin is an SOM building um, in Brooklyn and um, you know, basically in downtown Brooklyn, um, something that uh, tries to, I guess, call some attention to itself. <laughs> and it's, you think? Uh, yeah. um, as it goes down to the uh, parking garage, it even starts to, to undulate. Um, 
This is uh, actually the first of uh, three uh, stone buildings in a row. So we'll see the next one is uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Research Center. This, um, the Part E of this is similar to the Northwest Corner building by Maneo in that here we're kind of looking at the east facade, which is where the offices are. And those are, um, uh, the facade has these horizontal louvers. But then on the, uh, on the west is the research. Um, and those, uh, those spaces um, use frit glass, kind of this uh, almost checkerboard of uh, frit glass. Um, and then the, this terracotta wall that cuts through the whole building um, or at least it looks to do that from the outside is what um, kind of is the hinge between these two these two spaces and the two expressions. Next. And um, another one, 101 Warren Street, which is um, nearby here as well. It's, it's right across from the, um, the new uh, curving Battery Park City Community Center. Um, and this one, they, SOM, they, uh, I can't remember the, the designer at the moment from the office, but um, basically has this, uh, this stone pattern that alternates from um, every two floors um, in front of glass wall and then the occasional terrace. And I believe on top of the retail podium, there's a, a pine forest, I think is what it's called by uh, Thomas Balsley. Um, next. Um, Trump Soho Hotel by Handel Architects. Um, kind of uh, somewhat controversial for exploiting the, uh, the manufacturer zoning which allows for uh, transient hotels in the district um, and allows it to go to this enormous height. Um, basically, the, I think the, the owners of the units can live there for 30 days in a row, maximum, and then so many days out of a year. Um, and the firm I worked for, we actually did this sort of thing in Long Island City in the Dutch Kills area. And if you ever take the N train to Astoria and look out to the, um, to the west as you go after Queensboro Plaza, you'll see all these pencil buildings popping up. Um, they're all hotels for now. But um, that got rezoned to residential, so um, that put a halt on that. Um, next. This is Casa New York, um, oh, another uh, Enrique Norton project. Um, it's kind of hard to tell, but it actually is, a, it's supposed to be like an obelisk and actually taper as it rises. Um, but you really have to be looking from um, down the street to get that, that impression. Where but, is this? Um, it's 45th. 45th right off 6th. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't remember the name of the, the there's a park right here that's uh, or privately owned. Well, it was so, um, but it kind of has this uh, punch card um, thing that wraps, wraps the whole building. Um, next. Uh, William Beaver House, uh, Sow and McCown in the um, financial district, which if you're familiar with it, you realize it's this black tower that looks like it's drizzled in gold leaf. Um, by the time you get to the bottom, I mean, the, the, the yellow or the gold is practically gone, and then they kind of eroded the base, deconstructed this, uh, this wall. Um, not entirely successful in my book, but um, <laughs> next. Next one. Um, this is a view of the Westin on uh, 8th Avenue and 42nd, 41st, or 43rd, I mean, um, before the Times building went in and before the FX Fowl building uh, across the street from that went in. Um, you know, again, this is, this is one that, you know, it, it's in the book not because I love it, but because I think it's um, you know, it actually like takes this Times Square thing to heart and just makes the makes it architectural. It's not like some of the other Times Square towers that might be more of a muted gray high tech expression with a bunch of billboards slapped onto it. I mean, this has the billboards, but then it just kind of goes crazy from there. Um, next one, uh, fifteen Central Park West, um, Robert Stern. Um, 
This is, I believe, about uh, 33 or so stories, but that's in the, the western portion, which is on Broadway. And then um, there's a lower portion that uh, fronts um, Central Park West, which is what uh, kind of this is looking from Central Park. Next. Um, Hearst Tower, which um, is plopped on the old Joseph Urban six-story um, Hearst building. Um, and I think the, this one also was uh, a little controversial because of obviously this high-tech expression on top of um, this old building, old limestone building that uh, was actually designed to be added to eventually. Um, and I believe there was some um, architects that did alternative proposals in the more neoclassical vein, but those didn't go anywhere, obviously. But you know, each each of these these die grids that um, you know by using this structure, they're able to use about 20% less steel for the structural framing. Um, but each one is uh, four stories. Um, but again, this is a building I think. When you, when you step inside, you really want to keep going because you you know you see the inside of the of the facade. You see how thin the facade is, and then you see these massive structure needed to um, you know deal with that. And but it's you know all you see is the end of the waterfall. Um, next, one Madison Park by Setra Ruddy. Um, this one's just over 600 feet, and when you're there, it looks taller than the, uh, the, the MetLife Tower, but it's actually shorter by probably about 80, 82 feet. Um, and this, to me, kind of recycles an idea that Santiago Calatrava ha had uh, for South Street uh, Seaport area, where each cube cantilevered off a central mast would be a, a single townhouse. I mean, here, I think each unit is a full floor, but then there's these uh, cantilevered uh, five and six story portions that kind of reach out towards the MetLife Tower. Um, and also behind it, OMA, Rem Kulhas had planned a um, kind of um, alternative to the, the zoning tiering by kind of cantilevering the other way and to look around this building to the park. Um, but I think now that's going to be a much, much more scaled down version by, by such a ready. Next. Uh, Seven World Trade Center, obviously before all the um, construction. Um, this has a you know, very elegant glass curtain wall that, um, you know, I, I think, I mean, it's full height, full height glass that overlaps the, this curving stainless steel spandrel that gives it this very nice effect but um, you know I kind of wish the uh, One World Trade Center had glass as nice as this but um, next. Uh, 200 West Street which uh, you could see in the earlier slide for River House it was kind of in the in the background. Uh, this is um, Goldman Sachs headquarters um, and I believe this, this curve is kind of looking towards the other Goldman Sachs building across, uh, across the river in Jersey City. Um, and I, I was actually drawn to this building, not so much for the tower, but the, the, uh, the canopy at the pedestrian arcade. That's um, the uh, head of uh, Harvard GSD, I believe. Uh, Preston Scott Cohn designed that uh, canopy. Um, and then in the foreground is embassy suites or, or some hotel. Um, next, um, Time Warner Center, um, you know, twin-ish towers up uh, uh, Columbus Circle um, atop this um, curving uh, retail atrium. Um, next, Bloomberg um, Tower, Pelly Clark Pelly Architects. Uh, it's a mixed-use tower with uh, um, you know, obviously the, the namesake occupying most of the base and then some of the tower and then some residential um, above that. Um, I've always liked this elliptical space. I think it's called Beacon Court. Um, so again, this is, it's a, 
it's kind of crying out to be a public space more than just a car drop off, which is what it is, um, and you know entries for the for the various offices and residential. Next, Eight uh, Spruce Street, um, Frank Gehry, um, you know down by by City Hall and the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, most people probably know about about this building. Um, I went to a conference on facades last week, and uh, somebody from Gary Technologies talked about how basically a Frank Gary building could happen on this scale um, because it's, I mean, this is, I think, I have to look at my notes, but it's uh, the tallest, I think for the time being at least, the tallest all residential building in the U.S. Um, that always seems to be eclipsed uh, very fairly quickly, 76 floors. Um, but um, you know, basically, the, using their computer um, software, their Keisha and uh, Rhino and all that, they kind of mapped the facade into uh, types of panels that were either cheap, um, really expensive, or somewhere in between. And most of them fall into the cheap. Um, the effect isn't so much that. I mean, the, the minority obviously are in the, the expensive, the, the special ones, um, and then a f you know, few falling in between. Um, but then the idea is that the, um, these panels that comprise the facade are um, predominantly, you know, are able to come in supposedly on budget, um, but uh, still have the effect of this kind of rippling facade. Of course, on the south, it's completely flat. Um, Next, uh, New York Times building, uh, Renzo Piano. Um, again, mentioned this earlier because of the quality, I think, of the public spaces. Um, and we're able to get into the lobby and uh, there's an installation, um, movable type in the lobby and this um, courtyard that you can't get in, but it, it makes for a nice uh, nice space. and. Um, it's, it's covered with 186,000 ceramic rods. Um, I don't remember the specs on the size and all that, but they had to take a few off when um, two guys climbed the building uh, on the same day. But I think there's still 185,000, so it doesn't really do much, to, you know, it doesn't affect the uh, appearance. And this is one where, I mean, here I took the photo um, sunset, um, but, you know, this is, it's kind of like a barometer, this building, the way the, the rods uh, reflect or absorb the light. So in gray days, it's just extremely, extremely gray. Um, next and last, um, Bank of America, at One Bryant Park, uh, Cook and Fox. So it's 1,200 feet, but that's to the, the top of the antenna, um, which is, um, you know they've they've exploited that for um, you know lighting it up uh, nightly in a different color. It seems um, competing with the Empire State Building. Um, this view to me is the the best for the building. The way it kind of these facets um, rise up the building. Uh, it's not always um, successful from other views. Um, but the, here again, they actually did something with um, the public spaces. There's the uh, um, you know, a, a um, three-block connection um, lined in terracotta that abuts uh, four times square. And I think you can get into the lobby, but then there's also the urban garden room, which has some fake greenery, some tables and chairs. Um, and the so next one? You said fake greenery? Uh, is it real? It is oh, okay. Yes. Mm. There you go. <laughs> um, so that that's it. Um, any questions or comments? Um, I'm here. Thank you. We're going to turn the lights up a little bit. I'm sure there will be questions, um, and if there aren't in the audience, I have one. Yeah.
do that. Yeah. Hi. Uh, that's a terrific picture, by the way. Thank you. Uh, just a, a point of information uh, and then a question. The uh, building on 42nd Street, Bioplat Double, the, those lights, uh, that isn't just paying homage to the, the lights of 42nd Street. It's a legal requirement being oh, right. built. Um, well, I want to see if you agree with the statement that there are a bunch of buildings that you know I, I look like they're going to really work and then they lose conviction either because one side is just really boring like the, the Jean Nouvel on the highway looks great from you know what mm -hmm. you show but the other side when I see out of my window it's boring the um, yeah, the Frank Gehry building, uh, nothing, uh, the Spruce Street building, nothing on one side. And then there's another way in which buildings lose conviction. They sort of go off in a tame or commercial direction, like the uh, the one on Astor Place mm -hmm. by Guathme Single. Uh, could have been a kind of interesting tool, but then they stick this, you know, stupid base at the bottom. Right. So I just wondered if you could discuss this sort of, you know, a, a pulling back from making a good, strong statement and, you know, going timid or commercial or something. Uh, how do you uh, feel about that? Um, well, I, I mean, I... Uh, I mean, to take those one by one, I mean, the Jean Nouvel one, you know, obviously, I, it looks like they they designed it, and actually, if you look at those windows and kind of think about the other side, they almost, it almost seems to be kind of doing some of the same thing, but only, you know, doing part of it, you know, not like the whole curtain wall, but just having some of those windows be found on the back. But, I, I mean, it's, it's one of those things, I guess, where... Um, where, I mean, I'm, in, you know, I grew up um, in Chicago. That's where the bulk of my my work was, and it's the same sort of thing there. Where you have, you know, old buildings will have your your stone that just stops at the, you know, a few feet back from the facade, um, and I think you have that same um, consideration with any, you know, new old building. I mean, I think. Um, you know, Frank Gehry on, in Chelsea was able to do something kind of in the round, but for the most part, I think the probably the budgets aren't aren't there to be doing something all the way around. So like with the Gehry one, it seemed kind of unfortunate that one facade in its entirety had to be that one dollar sign you know, instead of two or three. Um, but I don't know with like the Nouvelle one if they're just waiting for something taller to to come in down the road and just cover that up. You know, I think a lot, in a lot of cases, architects will hope that, you know, will expect it to, um, you know, that if they're taller, it's only a matter of time before something else comes along. So. Um, what sort of new projects or future projects that are either under construction or slave construction are you excited about or thinking about? Um, I mean, I started thinking about that because I, I mean, I got a Q&A to do something online and I started to think, um, I mean, there, there is a chapter in my book on like, it's called New York City 2020, like what's happening. You know, if the book was the first decade, then that's the second decade. So at least my book won't be obsolete just yet. I mean, it's got a, a little bit more time. Um, but I, and maybe this is partly from this conference I went to where I saw um, shop architects talking about Barclays Center, which I haven't seen the construction. I know it's progressing, but I'm kind of anxious to see that, especially the way the public space is created and the way this, this building kind of comes down to the public space and you have that Oculus and LED liner and things. Um, and there's one that... Um, I mean, the, the big project on West 57th, hope, you know, if it moves along, I'm curious, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking um, if, if he's his, you know, I, he's a pretty good salesman, so I think he's probably, you know, I'm optimistic that that's, that's gonna happen. Um, I don't know if it'll have much impact, you know, I, on other buildings, um, but I'd love to see that actually, actually happen. And then, um, to bring it back down a little bit, there's, there's Javits, um, not the, the convention center, but the plaza 
in Lower Manhattan, which Michael Van Valkenburg is doing a, um, a new design, and I'm not necessarily excited about what that's going to be, but I've, I've written a lot on Martha Schwartz's curly Q benches that were there and Richard Serra's piece that was in before, so I'm kind of just curious how this next iteration um, happens. So that's a few. Take a look at the two ventilating towers in the World Trade Center and uh, tell us about that sometime in the future. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. The, the two buildings that are on the plaza, there's the, the, the um, the rest of the head of the down. Oh, yeah. And then there are two rather large buildings that are concrete, oh. wrapped in skin. And they look to me like they should come down here. <laughs> so I think that's all the venting for the trucks that are going to be parked well, underground. Oh, okay. That too? Okay. That's Davis Brody Bond, I think, did Perhaps. the vent towers or whatever those are called. And then. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I visited the memorial for the first time not too long ago. It was about three weeks ago. And um, I mean, from the beginning, I've always thought that the initial design was really strong. And then when, when Arid and Walker kind of let them take out the underground portion of it and put the names along the, the, the parapet, I thought that was a huge loss. Because I, I think that you know, having basically the memorial aspect here as opposed to kind of going down and experiencing the, the waterfalls was a shame. So, you know, I mean, I'm curious about the, the museum. I'd like to see that when it's, obviously when it's done. So my question, um, so well, I, I thank you for this lineup by, <laughs> because it's really a fascinating way to, to, um, to slice up the, um, the really surprising amount of production that was done in a decade that um, mm -hmm. one would think after 2001 would have so little action. And so yeah. I wonder if you have a broad comment. First of all, if you've counted how many of the projects started before September 11th and then were completed afterwards, or if you have any kind of broad view of why New York didn't suffer the setback in terms of um, sort of high style, in terms of economic development, and then why high style design seemed to actually flourish mm -hmm. after that time. I mean, I, I must say, I mean, in my research, like start dates weren't really part of that. So if they were pre 2001 or 2000, I'm not. Sure, I mean, I can imagine, say, uh, you know, for these buildings, uh, at least a five-year time frame. So, well, I mean, the Austrian Cultural Forum was 92, or, was, yeah, 92. It took 10 years to realize that building. Um, but, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, I was in Chicago for a lot of that, and Chicago rebounded pretty well, too, and I... I I think. Rebound. Well, <laughs> what did they have to rebound from? I know. But well, there was a lot of uh, residential high rises going up in Chicago, and then. But a recession is different than a, a catastrophic. Right, but then, well, in 2000, yeah, well, that's true. Um, but I mean, there. Were, I mean, the firm I was at was doing O'Hare Airport, so I mean, a third of the firm was laid off because of that. So I mean. And the effects weren't like here, obviously, but you know they were still felt. And um, I mean, I, I I don't know for sure how you know in response to your your second question, but maybe the third question is a is a part of it, you know, and just integrating or inserting these like star architecture buildings into the city. I mean, you had the Bilbao effect, which was more for cities that weren't on the map. But then when you started putting them into a city like New York, then it just, you know, it becomes a strong marketing tool and a, you know, a way to, to um, you know, raise a lot of attention and interest and all that. There was a, a period when developers developed the mindset that you had a star architect teamed up with, a, with a, an architect who knew how to do apartment buildings, but didn't have the sales value. 
then we, there was a period where um, the architects were all attached to other housing architects. Yeah. And um, because they thought that's what it would take. There was a lot of competition between developers during that period. And most of the condos rather than rentals. Right. Now with the switch back to rentals, uh, you know, it's not quite the same equation. Um, yeah. It'd be more of a seller's market if there's such an undersupply of apartments coming up. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying, I mean, there are, there's projects like the Big and Jean Nouvelle that have these names attached to them, but they're basically, you know, they're not rising out of the ground yet. I mean, there, I think, was some Christian de Portsman Park. He did, has one on 57th that's, you know, got underway, but, you know, a lot of the ones that have these names attached with them, you know, I don't really, I can't think of any others that are moving forward like that. Um, you maybe have it in the book, but you didn't have it in the show. The building that was originally called LMVH on 57th. Oh, it was 99. So. <laughs> it missed the cut. It missed the cut. Uh, it, it didn't make the cut. And it, there are these sidebars, and I, I keep feeling maybe I should have put, you know, a, almost sidebar where ones okay, that were well, like four times square is 99 and because people usually divide it I mean it's like you know it's like it's sort of divide in the world people like the Austrian cultural center versus people who like <laughs> the um, uh, uh, LMH or whatever right. it's called now so we know that you like the Austrian cultural center but what do you think of LMVH? I mean as a like at this as a curtain wall building, I, I really like it. I mean, the, the different types of glass and the way it's, I mean, I, I think anything that tries to do something as it, I mean, to me, they're very similar in how they actually do something as they move up the, the kind of zoning envelope that's a given, you know, in just about any project. So instead of it just, you know, tearing, tearing up, they're actually, he's kind of folding in and out and, you know, and the way he combines that with the different types of glass, I think it works really well. Where's the other Fifty-seventh. Uh, just two. Yeah.